Did I detect a hint of racism up in there? So I don't know what. God lives in England? I thought he was a Texan. I know, I, I know Paul was a Texan, right? Anyway, all right. I don't think he really cares about football. What we call soccer. Anyway, all right. So that'll be at 2 p.m. our time. Right, okay. Praise the Lord. I'm going to talk to you a minute or two or three or 50 this morning. Because I'm going to talk about some things that happen in life. And I'm, it happens to a lot of us. Things happen. It's the Forest Cup rule. Things happen. And maybe you had an experience with the Lord. Many people have experiences with him. They, they never really come to Christ, but they have experience with the Lord. And somebody patted them on the back and told them that meant they were saved. And then some people have an experience with the Lord and encounter him and come to Christ in a supernatural, miraculous fashion, like most of us on some level. Everybody's testimony is different. But it's all the same. We were lost and undone and needed him, and he had mercy on us. Yeah, that's it. And then life happens. And occasionally, during the course of life, while it's happening to you, you get sidetracked. And, and, and most of the time, you don't get sidetracked intentionally. You go, I'm going to run away from God today. Or I'm going to do my own thing and pull further and further away from him to where I'm completely forgot. No, 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 you usually don't do that. But usually it's little things. Yeah. One little thing at a time, one little thing at a time. Occasionally it's something big. Something happens that just sidetracks you. Something happens that just flabbergast you. I mean, how long has it been since you heard that word used? <laughs> yeah, you know. And, and then the Lord will have to get your attention. I want to talk a little bit this morning about King David. I love preaching about David. When I preach about David, he's my favorite character in the Bible. It's <laughs> like when I preach about Elijah, he's my favorite character in the Bible. You know, when I preach about Paul, he's my favorite character in the Bible. But this morning, King David is my favorite. And, and we all know the story. David's life is an open book. Aren't you glad that the Bible didn't try to hide anything about people in, in the world? Right. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you go to read your Bible, it's, it's, you better be careful because it is not PG rated. Wow. The Bible comes with a mature rating, with an R rating. I'm just telling you. And David had slain a giant. David had done great exploits. David had, was a mighty man of God who was anointed by God to be king. The, the current king at the time didn't like that. Of course not. And so he made up his mind that he was going to kill David. King Saul did. And can you imagine being young David who, now please just think a minute. Can you imagine being young David who, who was in obscurity the first part of his life? Nobody knew who David was. He, he loved the Lord. He, he was a worshiper from, from the time he came out the womb. I'm, I'm convinced. But, but then all of a sudden he gets promoted and, and elevated. Because he kills a giant and you know, the, the, the prophet had showed up at his daddy's house and anointed him over all of his older brothers and said, you're going to be king, blah, 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 and all this. And, and don't you know David was overwhelmed? As a young man at that time, he was, he was still a young man. Probably at that time, most people agree, most, most theologians agree, he was probably a teenager. And then things happen, things happen. So he goes to Saul's house. He lives now. He moves from being in the field with the sheep, to being in the king's house and in prominence and, and all this and all the other king. And, and then the king gets jealous of him. 
decides to kill it. He served the king. Think about this. He served King Saul with a pure heart. Mm -hmm. He yep. loved Saul. Jonathan, Saul's son, was the best friend David ever had. He was closer to him than his own brothers were. I wonder if you put yourself in David's position, what you would have thought. How I would have, how I would have felt. How confusing that must have been. I know uh, it's 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 not uncommon. However, it is a bit saddening that, especially a lot of us preachers, we try to rosy everything up, tell you how wonderful it is, and if you'll just come to Jesus this morning, if you'll just make Jesus Lord, you'll never cry again. You'll never have any knee pain, back pain, heart pain, butt pain, or any other kind of pain in your life. Your children are going to straighten up and be wonderful children that love Jesus. Your wife, your spouse, your husband is never going to argue with you again. You're going to have all the money that you ever need. You'll never get behind on your bills again. Your boss is suddenly going to like you. <laughs> and give you a raise. You know, we, it, it's, 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 it's comical, really, if it wasn't so sad. Sometimes, because the guy like me with a mic in his hand paints that picture, and then you look at life and you go, <laughs> that's not the life I'm living. I wonder in his position, Robbie, what what you or I would have felt like in David's shoes. Yeah. And David ran from Saul because he had to. And y'all know the story. Through all that, David's heart still, God still called him a man after my own heart. And and at one point, and, and I, I preach about this frequently, and it is kind of humorous, but it's also powerful. At one point, David is hiding from Saul, and, 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 and he's hiding in a cave. It's dark in the cave. David's hiding in the cave. Saul's looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. Saul needed to go to the bathroom. So he sees a cave. I'm telling you, this is in the Bible, folks. Yeah. David, David hiding in the cave. Saul comes into the very cave that the man he's trying to kill is hiding in. David's men are going, is this God or what? God has brought this man to us so we can kill him and go build about our business. I mean, is there any more of a vulnerable position than a man in the cave using the bathroom? I'm not trying to be vulgar, but it is a little comical, but I am trying to be real. So Saul's in there using the bathroom so close to David that David takes his knife, cuts off a piece of Saul's skirt. Yes, Saul was wearing a skirt because God's pants hadn't been invented yet. Get over it. Cuts off a piece of Saul's skirt. He must have been Scottish. <laughs> no, for me. <laughs> and he cuts off a, a, a piece of Saul's skirt. Saul finishes his business, goes on. David's men are ticked at him. You could have killed him. And David's going, I would not touch God's anointing. Right. Listen, God wants to promote you. But promotion doesn't come before humility. Not in the kingdom. In the world it does many times. God wants to promote you. But he going to do it his way. And his way doesn't always line up with the intellectual way, with the carnal way. His way doesn't ever line up with the world's way. David's men were ticked at him. We could have had him. Why didn't you kill him? Why didn't you kill him? He said, how dare I touch God's anointing? God's anointing. Do you think, do you, I want you to understand something. This didn't go on for a few days. This didn't go on for a few weeks. This didn't go on for a few months. Ladies and gentlemen, this went on for several years. Waiting on God's promise, 
while somebody's trying to kill you, you delivered the very nation of Israel by killing the giant, and then you wound up running for your life by the, running from the king that was too afraid to go do battle with the giant. Think about it. Do you suppose that you might have gotten, if you had been David, a little bit sidetracked? Perhaps? Ever? Quiet up in here. I suppose I might have. And I suppose that David did too at times before he was king. There came a place, and we're about to read, but there came, go ahead, Joby, if you would, and put it all up there. But there came a, there came a time when David decided to align himself. Now listen, I know I'm talking about King David and I'm talking about things that happened thousands of years ago and I'm talking about Israel, I'm about to talk about the Philistines and all that, but I want you to understand and whoever's watching to understand that who I'm really talking about is you and me and what I'm really talking about, the when I'm really talking about is right now and the how I'm really talking about is how we are. David perhaps out of frustration, perhaps out of not knowing what else to do, perhaps out of just throwing his hands up and going, I'm tired of fighting, I'm tired of running. He decided to align himself with the very enemies of his nation. What? He goes to the Philistines and said, I will help you fight now against King Saul. Was he double-minded or what? Perhaps a little. He was willing, out of frustration or whatever other emotion you think you can conjure up or think about, I'm guessing it was by more than just one reason, but he decided to align himself with the very enemies of God, the very enemy of his nation, the, the very nation that birthed the giant that he had to kill. What? Yes. No. Yes. And can you imagine David knowing in his heart that, I mean, he had to know that this can't be right, but yet doing it anyway. I know none of y'all ever done anything like that. Hmm. Oh, this can't be right, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Not us. So it goes to him. He's, by, by this time, he has amassed a small army himself. He had some guys that were ready to fight. See, see, God sent David all the, what the world called the misfits. The guys that were running from the law, the guys that had warrants out. Yeah. No, no, y'all got it. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. God sent him all those that had warrants out for him. God sent him all those that had, were, wait, God sent him some guys that were even convicted felons. Oh, no. I've seen some guys that the church would look at and go, well, I'll keep your children away. God seen, God seen some guys that, that need to talk to that man's ex-wife to find out what he's really like. That's the kind of guys, but, but see, God began to change them. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't leave you the way he found you? Aren't you glad that, that your past can no longer define you? You yeah. may be running right now going, I don't know who yeah. I'll align myself with. I've heard about this King David. Sounds like he's crazy, but I know him to be a giant killer. Yeah. So I'd rather align myself that's with it. a crazy giant killer that's a bit unpredictable than try to align myself with the church world that don't really want to have anything to do with me anyway. Amen. So he lines up and he goes to the Philistines. And he says, I'm willing to fight King Saul, would you? Now you think they go, yes! <coughs> you think they go, our former enemy is now going to be on our side. We're going to do this thing. And they looked and they went, no, -uh. they still weren't over Goliath. 
Don't you know in that meeting, do you remember he killed the giant? Do you remember he killed one of us? Do you remember us running with our tails tucked between our legs when this man was just a teenager? Well, look at him now. He's got a whole army. We can't trust him. Let me just tell you something, man. When you walk outside of the perimeters of the kingdom of God, when you walk away from the anointing of God and you try to align yourself with the world, it just won't work. The world, you don't fit in. Come on, I, you ever been in that place where you got to have your foot, one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom? It just, you don't fit either place. The, you don't fit in the world, and then you don't fit in the kingdom anymore. Let's let that soak in a minute. And the Philistine leadership told David, Get on out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. If you'll turn on your own king, you'll turn on us too. We don't trust you. David had been in a place called Ziglag. David had taken his men I want you to hear it. Now, here's the real message this morning. David was encamped in this place. Got away from the plan of God, so to speak. Took all of his warriors. Took all of his felons. <laughs> took all of the people that the bondsmen were looking for. Amen. Left all of their wives and children and all of their stuff back at the camp. Took his whole, whole army, took his whole army to the Philistines to offer their services. They said no. When he came back, I want to read you what he found. Now, let's pick up in verse 1 there. In 1 Samuel 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded. Oh, yeah, the Philistines weren't the only enemies. All those ites and kites. Uh -huh. None of them were good. The Amalekites had came while David was gone and had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein and they didn't kill any of them the bigger little great or small but carried them away and went on their way so David and his men came to the city behold it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive are y'all with me this morning I feel more passionate about this message this morning than I'm preaching than I have in a while. And, and, and then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Leave it on verse 5 for a minute. They came back and another enemy had burned the place down. They came back, and another enemy, enemy had another enemy, another enemy <laughs> had burned the place down and taken all their wives as hostages, all their children, yeah. all their stuff. Now they didn't know that per se. For all they knew at that time, they had killed everybody. And the Bible says that they wept so hard for so long that they didn't have any more power to cry. I know many of you have been so broken that you have cried and you have wailed and you have wept and your heart has hurt so bad that you didn't think you could live another second and then you were mad at God because you woke up the next morning That's right. still alive. The word says they wept till they had no more power to leave. See, the enemy, for one thing, 
will try to break you of all emotion when you can't feel anymore. When you can't weep anymore. Let's read on. And David's two wives were taken captive. This gal, the judge of Elitis, how do you say that? And Abigail, who I'm convinced was the wife that David loved the most. But Abigail, who had been the wife of the fool of Carmelite, maybe all means fool. You got some whole other message. I won't go there and take you 20 minutes to even give you the highlights of it. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke to stone in him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Check it out. David had led, shoot, David had led these people, led his army, his warriors the wrong direction, and it cost him everything. He got back and the whole place was burned to the ground and all of the sons and daughters and wives were taken captive. You ever made a decision that cost you everything? I know many of you have. Mm. And they were so angry, so broken. So David, not only has he lost everything, now his men were beginning to turn against him. They're talking about it's all his fault. Isn't it funny how we got to have somebody to blame? Come on. Yeah. There's got to be a devil in every storm. Come on, y'all. There's got to be a devil in every family. There's got to be somebody that it's all their fault. Anything that goes wrong got to be that one's fault. In a way, it was David's fault, actually, because those men trusted him. If you're in leadership, especially in the body of Christ in any way, if you're in leadership, you better be careful how you lead. You better be thinking about how you lead because you're influencing people. And you better know, man, if you're saying you've been led by God, you better know you have been led by God. Because if it's the wrong thing or the wrong motive, it's not going to just affect you. It's going to affect your family. Come on, man. Be a man. Stand up and do the right thing. It's going to affect your family. It's going to affect you. Your, your job, it's going to affect your community. It's going to affect everything. And now, they're talking about, hey, i got a great idea. Let's stone David. Hey, let's kill him. Like, that's going to help anything. David was, please hear this. Jesus, let me preach this message properly. Here's David. He had lost everything he loved. He had lost every one he loved. And everybody that had trusted him, everyone that he had influence over, now turned on him and hated him. Some of you, some of us, have been in that position before. And David, but David, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Yes. I hope this helps you. When you've made a mistake, when you've messed up so bad, did it cost you everything? When you just knew that you were following God's will and it didn't work out and it didn't work out, and you had a vision from God, you had a dream from the Lord, you, you had had a word from God, and it just looked like it never was going to work, so you decided to get out there on your own and do this thing, and most of the time when people do that, they'll go, well, God led me to, God told me, that God didn't lead him to go to the Philistines, but I found out something as a pastor a long time ago, when somebody says, God told me to do something, you might, John no really used to tell me, you might as well do it. Not even hard because they ain't going to do it anyway. I've also found out something about you humans. <laughs> and most of you in here are humans. <laughs> a human is going to do what that human wants to do no matter who says what. That's right. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Doesn't matter if it's the best thing to do. If you make up your mind as a human, this is what I'm going to do. That's what you're going to do. When David got to the end of himself, please hear this. 
See, see, I know my Father, and He's merciful, He's just, He's good, He's graceful, He's gracious. And I know that most times, dare I say, every time, you have to give to the end of yourself. You have to give to the end of yourself before you give him much to use. Doesn't matter what your talents are, doesn't matter what your abilities are. I've got this talent, I've got this ability. I've seen talent really hurt people more than it helped them many times in their life. Because they're leaning on their own ability, they're leaning on their own talent. And it may be God given. David finally got here. You're going to see in a minute how it all played out. But David finally got to the end of himself. And when everybody else was against him, he had to go back. Now, now the Bible doesn't say this. I'm, 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 I'm giving me, give me some artistic license here. But he had to go back to the original vision. He had to go back to the one that never forsook him. And he encouraged himself in the Lord. And nobody else will encourage you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. That's right. Yeah. All right. And, and David said to, to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray you, bring me here the ephod. And Abiathar brought there the ephod to David. David finally got to the place. Now, what the ephod was, and I'm trying to give this fast forward version. The ephod was a way that they inquired of God. An ephod was a thing that the priest had that if you wanted to get a word from God, you went to the prophetic voice of God, not what you conjured up out of your own heart. Be careful, charismatic Pentecostals, to not call what you conjure up out of your own heart the Holy Ghost. That is a form, my friend, of blasphemy. You felt mad in your mind and in your heart to do something, you just thought, well, it must be God speaking to me. Be careful. Because what you conjure up and what you think isn't always the voice of God. Dare I say, seldom is it the voice of God. So David had finally gotten through it, running from God and trying to do things his own way. He went back to the house of God and goes, I need a word from God. Somebody in this house this morning, somebody that's listening to this, you know that you need a word from God. Maybe you're at the end of yourself and you put on a good old smiley face and everything is good. How you doing, Lord? How you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored. And inside you're melting down and Rome is burning. David finally, this little verse right here is powerful. He said, let's go to the priest. Bring me the ephod. I need a word from God. I'm trying. I'm tired of trying to figure it out on my own. I'm trying. I'm tired of trying to do things my own way. It ain't working. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I pursue after this truth? Should I chase these guys?" I've already been running over here, and when I did, it cost me everything. Shall I chase the ones that burnt my city down and took my wife and kids and all my other soldiers' wives and kids hostages? Should I do this? Don't you know, in a way, if the Lord was human, he'd go, well, it's nice for you to ask. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> don't you know in the heavenlies, this Holy Spirit of God in the heavenly realm is going. David is finally looking towards the Lord and away from the world and away from his own self. Please hear this, children. He's finally asking God, what should I do? Wouldn't it have been nice if he'd have asked the Lord before that? But see, the thing of it was, he didn't have to ask the Lord before that because he had it all going on. He had his own little army. He's running from Saul. He's running, but everything's okay. He's gaining prominence. He's got, he's got friends that are Philistines. He's there. And then the Philistines said, uh-uh. 
And then when he comes back, everything is burned. Now, shall I pursue after this trip? Question number one. Should I go after this? Question number one. Should I do this? Well, how many of us have ever did something just because we decided that's what we wanted to do and then it wasn't what we were supposed to do? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been nice? Well, many times in my life, sure would have been nice if I'd have had the sense to ask. Shall I pursue them? Huh. Am I going to overtake them? If I do pursue them, is it going to be a victory? And he answered him, talking about the Lord, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Just look at your neighbor and say, I believe in God that you're going to recover all. Just tell your neighbor that. Make me feel better. I did, I did that make you feel better? And I looked at you know, the other day and say, I believe you're going to recover all, too. Now look across the room at the one you don't like. That's the reason you're sitting all the way across the room from I believe you're going to recover all. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He said, go. No. Lord said, don't you know that in a way, in the, in the heavenly realm, in the spirit realm, all that they were waiting on to happen was for David to get in agreement with God. That's right. For you shall recover all. And David went, he and 600, the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor. For those that were left behind stayed. I'd like to preach that little thing now. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 above behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook. Hold it right there. Go to verse 11, but hold it right there on 11. Started out with 600 men. 200 of them went so far. And that's as far as they could go physically. That's as far as they could go emotionally. I don't see here that David made a spectacle of them. I don't see here that David just said, well, you're no good. No. I see that David went on, didn't say a word about it. So he started with 600. He's down to 400. What does he have? Let me tell you what he has. He has a word from God. That's right. If you're living your life, if you're pursuing something, if you're chasing after something without a word from God, let me just tell you, it's going to be a disaster. Most likely, it's going to be a disaster. If you're chasing after life, if you're looking at your goal, and it's not what God has spoken to you to do or led you to do, and it's not going to end well. And as a pastor for a long time, and being in ministry for a long time, there's a lot of times I'm going, well, okay, if somebody's going to, ta-da, and I'm, I don't want to try to argue with them. Well, you're going to do it well, okay. It's going to end well. People get further and further away from God and try to justify it. And try to go, well, I'm, I'm backing away because I'm being led to go do this. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end of that, I'm like, where are you at with him again? Oh, that's right. Huh. And you don't do it in judgment unless you don't do it in condemnation. You just go, okay, well, you know, if I love you, I'm going to be there for you. And I have you pick up the pieces. If you're a child of God, that's your attitude anyway. That's right. Amen. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And gave him bread, and he ate. And they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. Boy, this guy's eating good, isn't he? Yeah. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said, who do you belong to? Where are you from? 
And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt serving to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. Pause on 14. Here's a little side story. Isn't it interesting how the Holy Spirit of God just kind of adds some of these little things in the Word of God? They're doing it. Some of David's men found an Egyptian. Not a friend. Right. Come on. Right. Found an Egyptian laying out there dying. Found a person from an enemy's kingdom laying out there dying. Brought him to David. They're going, don't you know, string him up here. I'll teach him a lesson there. No, no, David said, feed him. Give him some water. Feed him. Feed him a little more. Now give him some dessert. Life came back into him. And I said, now tell us who you are. Where you're from. He was in slavery to the Egyptians. Excuse me, he was an Egyptian slave to the Amalekite. Let me say it right. He was an Egyptian that was in slavery to, to an Amalekite. Think about this. Y'all ever read and think, I hope yeah. you do. Don't you know those Jewish boys are going, oh, he's an Egyptian. Yeah, the Egyptians held us in slavery for hundred years and treated us horribly. Yeah, now you're finally getting what's coming. Oh, oh, you poor little Egyptian. Oh, you're a slave now. Ha ha. Now you know what we felt like. Amen. Amen. Well, my people are. Oh, you're, you're a slave to the Amalekite. Ha ha ha. I think we ought to kill you. Yeah. Here's this man that did not know the true and living God laying in a field because he was a slave that got sick and his master rather than trying to nurse him back to hell just to die he's not worth much anyway we just leave him to die I got me some new slaves from these Jewish boys with David see there's some people out there in our lives some of us have been that Egyptian I think that kind of surmises who I've been in my life. Some of us have been that Egyptian, yep. left to die, never knew God, didn't have a concept of the one true God, serving one of the ites, one of the Amalekites that was godless as a slave, and then got sick and was dying and just left out there to die. And the church world said, well, see, he's an enemy. He's getting just what he deserves. Look at his heritage. Look at the family. Okay, yeah, he's an Egyptian. He's getting just what he should deserve. Ha, ha, ha. That's how a lot of the church world and religious world thinks. Amen. David, on the other hand, recently had learned what it was to be all alone. Recently had learned what it was for people to turn on you, had a heart for God and a heart from God. And he said, feed, let's talk to him. God had strategically placed this Egyptian person, this Egyptian man has had been strategically placed there by God for more than one reason. Number one, to save this person's life. And to provide a little intelligence mm -hmm. to David's army. We made an invasion upon the south of these guys and upon the coast that belongs to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned the Ziglag with fire. Now, if it couldn't have gotten any worse, now it just did. Don't you know that those guys with David thought, oh wait, he was one of the guys that burned our village. He was one of the guys that killed our people. He was one of the guys that took our wives and children's hostage. He just admitted to it. He's there, guilty as charged. String him up and teach him a lesson. I'm not Egyptian. I don't know if I'd have said all that. <laughs> I might have left some of that out. No, he didn't. And David said to him, 
can you get me to these people? And he said, uh, I, I love the Egyptian here. He wasn't plumb dumb, was he? He wasn't completely stupid, was he? He said, he said can you get me there? And he said, swear to me by God that you're not going to kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you to this place. Have y'all ever really thought about this story before in Scripture? This Egyptian, I don't know what the, listen, I'm serious, I'm serious. And I'm running out of time, so I've got to go fast forward here. I don't know what David's guys were saying. If I were really to say, but I can speculate, and I think we know humanity pretty well to understand about what some of them were saying. And so he realized, I'm an Egyptian. This Jewish man that should hate me and my kind has been merciful to me and gave me food when I was dying and water when I was thirsty. And I was with the company that burned his city and took hostage his people. And he's asking me if I can give them to him, so there must be something merciful in this man. I'm convinced they'll see that he saw something in David that he had never seen in another human's eyes. My prayer, I'm sidetracking, but my prayer is that when we're, whether we're on the street over here at, at Commerce Square or when somebody new walks in our doors or when a new neighbor moves in or we're just in the checkout line at, at Walmart or all subs, if you're still going to all subs, yeah, uh, uh, my prayer is that the, the people that we come in contact with would see something different in us. Yeah, man, that's it. Because this one's not going to hurt this one's not going to abuse. This one's not going to lead me astray. So this Egyptian boy says, swear to me, swear to God to me. Pinky promise, whatever you want to look at it. Crosses don't count. You know, that you're not going to kill me or let me go back into the slavery that I was in before. Don't turn me back to my master and don't kill me. And I'll take you where you want to go. See, there are people in the world right now that have been strategically placed. Mm -hmm. Y'all ain't trying to hear all this, especially right. in the church world. There are people in the world right now that have been strategically placed along your path that normally nobody else would have anything to do with. And if we, sometimes we're so blind that we miss that Egyptian in the field. Right. That God has set there for us to help and bring life to, but then that one's going to turn around and give you something that you never saw coming. He called that person right there, gave David exactly what he was looking for, and he never saw it coming. And the reason right. that it happened is because he was merciful to this slave. That's exactly right. Yeah. Y'all ever read the Bible and think? Man, I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, wow. Okay. And David said, can you bring it down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go back to verse 15. I didn't finish it. That you won't kill me or deliver me in the hands of my master, and I'll bring you down this company. Okay, now go to 16. And when he brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth. Sound like there's a bunch of them. Yeah. All over the place, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David spoke them from the twilight even until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. The Egyptian led David right to the people that had burned his city and took his wife and, and his children hostage. And when they found them, they were eating and drinking and dancing and having a big party, celebrating the fact that they had stolen all this stuff. And David killed for over a full day. <laughs> David fought for over a full day and killed every one of them except 400 that ran off on camels. <laughs> There's a message there. I'll preach it another day. I don't have time. 
And David recovered all. Oh, wait a minute. And David recovered how much? All. all. How much? All. all. And David recovered all. all. That the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. And we're going to stop on verse 19 right here. And David recovered all. all. Let's try it again. David recovered all. all. Why did he recover all? I told him he would. <laughs> Bingo. Bing, 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 bing. Because God gave him a word. He didn't just accidentally find the Egyptian. He just didn't accidentally decide that this is the thing to do. He had decided, although some of y'all have made some decisions lately, that it is not God's will. I'm just going to go ahead. I don't even know who I'm talking to. Maybe somebody like, you made some decisions lately that they're going to cost you and have costed you. And sometimes our pride is stronger than our pain. Hallelujah. We would rather take more pain that hurt our ego and pride and admit we were wrong. We a messed up bunch, ain't we? <laughs> he, he recovered all because God had given him a word. Stand to your feet if you will, please. David recovered all. Now here's what would be easy for me to do right here. And I'm preaching this message and you shall recover all. It would be really easy for me right here to go, and you're going to recover all. You're going to recover all no matter what your circumstance is. You're going to recover all. Hallelujah. And, and, and emotionally stir this crowd and have you swinging from the chandelier, so to speak, and not have any conditional thing at all. Here's how you recover all. Would you like to know, have you lost anything? Have you, have, have you been in pain? Have you lost anything? Is it cost you something that you weren't willing to pay yet? It cost you anyhow? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Uh, would you like to recover everything that has been stolen from you? Yes. Sure. Would you like to recover relationships, uh, mindsets? Uh, I could go on and on and on. Basically, re recover your true relationship with the Lord God Almighty. Or is your ego and pride so big that you'll go, well, he's, he's here. I've never really strayed. Oh. Or would you rather recover all? Any takers? You lost something, you'd like to recover it all? Okay, all right. Would you like to know how? Here's how, based on this biblical principle, here's how David recovered all. He swallowed his pride. He went to the house of God. He got a prophetic word from God Almighty, he did it the proper way. He didn't try to cut corners and do it his own way. He asked the Lord, what do I need to do? And then when the Lord gave him a word, he did it. Oh, wait, wait, no, that's too hard. Wait, no. I'll take the word of God, but I'm not, not if there's going to be any conditions on it. You know? No. He got the word of God from the mouth of God. And the Lord said, do it, do it like this. He still didn't know how it was going to play out. So he, he got a word from God and he pursued the way that God told him to. But he was merciful enough to when he came by the Egyptian young man that was in slavery, he went, man, I remember when I needed mercy. Nobody believed in me. I remember when I was dying of thirst. Everybody giving up on me. And here's this young man dying in the field. We're going to stop a minute, fellas. 
We're going to feed this boy. Give him something to drink. Now give him some dessert. We like dessert up in here, don't we? Yeah. You ain't got to agree. I can tell by looking at you like dessert up in here. But when he got that word from God, he did not get sidetracked. And there was a little test that he had in the past called, Are you going to be merciful? He got a word from God. He gave life to somebody else that nobody cared anything about. And God used that very Egyptian, God used that very one to lead him to the place that he was supposed to be in. Now I can say, with that pattern, with that direction, Jesse, you can recover all, brother. Amen. No, you can't do it your way. I want to do it my way. Because I think I'm the smartest one. I think I know. I think I know better than God. Yeah, well, good luck, but you can't do it your way. Hear the word of God and then chase them. Have mercy on somebody that nobody else will have mercy on. And it may well be that God will use that person to lead you to victory. Who knows? Y'all ever heard that preach before? Because quite frankly, I haven't. I'm just wondering. I'm either out of my mind or maybe I'm on to something. I want to recover all, sis. Don't you? I want to recover all. I'm going to recover all. I'm just saying, I'm going to recover all. Do God's way, you going to recover all. Do God's way, you going to recover all. that the enemy has stolen. Every lie that the enemy has spread about you. Every relationship that's been broken. Your sons, your daughters, your stuff. Your sons, your daughters, your stuff, your city. It may look like it's been burnt to the ground right now, or possibly it has, but God is able to restore and you can recover all. Close your eyes if you will. Haven't done this in a few weeks, so I'm about to do it. You guys go with me. If that's you and you'd like to recover all, let's start by making this declaration. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer and get you to repeat it with me. Let's start there. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Father, Father my, heart my heart is to recover all. To recover all. And today, today, I covenant with you, Lord Almighty, you, Lord Almighty to recover all. To that, said, Lord, that said, Lord, I need a word from you. So speak to me, Father. Lead me by your spirit. And give me the heart and the attitude to be obedient. To be faithful to your leading. You must increase while I decrease. And Father, I covenant again with you today. Follow you wholeheartedly to recover all. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. The one who died in my place. The one who had mercy on me when no one else would. And rose from the dead. And gave me the ability by the power of his resurrection to recover all. Help me, Lord, to be obedient to you in this path. 
In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. I appreciate those of you that, I'm going to dismiss you just a second, give me a second. I appreciate those of you that have been participating in our online prayer sessions. That was a novel idea that I believe was from the Lord. And, and we've been doing it at different times. We did it a couple times at midnight. We did it the other night at 10 o'clock. Most likely this Tuesday, we will do an online prayer thing again. And, and, and we, we do it by a Zoom. If you'd like to be part of the Zoom thing, if you have the capacity to do Zoom, you can be on, on that. But whether you're on the camera or not, just know that when you log in, we're all praying together. And when, as, as we read the people's names and or their requests, when, as y'all are agreeing with me, God is doing stuff. And man, I've already had some feedback from those that said, y'all thanks for praying for me the other day. You don't know how much I needed that the other night at midnight. Or God's already touched me, things like that. So... I will send them, I'll send a, a text out and stuff or a message out and stuff. Uh, and we'll probably do that again this Tuesday night. I'm not sure what time. Probably not midnight, maybe 10 o'clock. But thank you all for participating in that. And one last thing. I started about three weeks ago asking if you would, if everyone would make a commitment to pray 10 minutes a day for your church, 10 minutes a day. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that some of y'all are doing that. And I can't ask you hard enough. I can't be passionate enough about it. Please give 10 minutes a day. Strategic prayer for your church. For not, yeah, I'm not just your needs. Not just what you think. You're, you do that too. But 10 minutes a day. Interceding for your brothers and sisters in the church. Interceding for your church. And if you'll do that, I really appreciate it. God bless you. It's Wednesday night, 630 sharp right here. And then we'll be back in the parking lot. Good night.